is advised. Okay, I cannot go in the execution chamber and die in the execution chamber Serial killer. as a liar. And I cannot go in the execution chamber and be executed under the devil. Serial killer. I have to come clean and clean, cleanse my spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Serial killer. And that, this is the last time I'm going to say it. You have to kill Eileen Morris because she'll kill again. Eileen Warnus was born Eileen Carol Pittman in Rochester, Michigan on February 29, 1956. Her mother, Diane Warnus, was 15 years old when she eloped and married Eileen's father, 16-year-old Leo Dale Pittman, on June 3, 1954. After less than two years of marriage and two months before Eileen was born, Diane filed for divorce. Eileen never met her father, as he was incarcerated at the time of her birth. He was in prison for the rape and attempted murder of a seven-year-old girl. Leo Pittman was a child molester and a sociopath who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was in and out of prison all the time. He committed suicide by hanging in a cell on January 30th, 1969. In January 1960, Diane abandoned her children, leaving them with their maternal grandparents, Lori and Britta Warnos, both alcoholics. They legally adopted Keith and Eileen on March 18th, 1960. Instead of a happy, loving home, it turned out to be a house of horrors. Eileen was sexually abused and molested and beaten as a child by her alcoholic grandfather. Before beating her, he would force her to clean the belt that hung on the wall, strip out of her clothes, lay spread eagle on her stomach, or bent over a table so he could have a good view, then he would beat her. These beatings left her traumatized physically and psychologically. Eileen turned into a quiet, troubled, friendless, antisocial, withdrawn, scared, and lonely child. She also began a sexual relationship with her brother at the age of 11 and was fast becoming a wild child that was born with a quick temper. The rebellious 11-year-old would sneak out of her bedroom window and head out to a local area known as the Pits, the party where she would take off her clothes and have sex for loose change. Warnos also began selling herself at school in exchange for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She became known as a cigarette pig. A cigarette pig is someone who has sex in exchange for items of negligible value, such as cigarettes or alcohol. An example is, that cigarette pig sucked his dick for a movie ticket. In 1970, at the age of 14, she became pregnant after being raped by a local pedophile nicknamed Chief, who was a friend of her grandfather's. Chief would later commit suicide. Warnos gave birth to a boy at a home for unwed mothers on March 23, 1971, and the child was placed for adoption. A few months after her son was born, Eileen began to run away and get into trouble with the law. Devastated by the adoption of her son, she dropped out of school, and in that same year, her grandmother Britta, who she loved most and loved her back unconditionally, died of liver failure. But at home, the sexual abuse and beatings continued, and when she was 15, her grandfather threw her out of the house. He tired of her explosive temper and attitude. Now homeless, Eileen moved into the woods at the end of the street into a fort that her and her brother had built when they were younger. When winter came, she spent winters in an abandoned car, and would wash up at a gas station. She supported herself as a hitchhiking prostitute. After living outside for two years and suffering through two winters, she began hitchhiking and prostituting across the U.S. to warmer climates. On May 27, 1974, at the age of 18, she was arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado for driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, and firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. Eileen served a year behind bars. After being released, she began hitchhiking around the U.S. again and ended up in Daytona Beach, Florida. She turned to pool hustling and part-time waitressing, going by the name of Lee. In 1976, at the age of 20, she met 69-year-old Yacht President Louis Gratzfell. Desperate for security and affection that she craved her whole life, she finally seen a chance at a normal life. Eileen married a wealthy Louis Fell. The announcements of the nuptials were printed in the local newspaper society pages. However, it didn't take long until Warren's streetlight demons and blackout temper came to surface. She verbally and physically abused her 69-year-old husband, beating him with his own cane, whenever he refused to give her money. 
He filed for a restraining order against her within weeks of the marriage. Eileen alone again went back to her old ways and hit up the local bars, prostituting, hustling pool and drinking to drown her sorrows. She got into fight after fight with men and women. Even though she was only 5 foot 4, she was tough as nails. On July 17, 1976, her brother Keith died of throat cancer and Mornos received $10,000 from his life insurance. Four days later, on July 21st, Eileen Warnos and Louis Fell annulled their marriage. The marriage had only lasted nine weeks. In August 1976, Warnos was given a $100 fine for drunk driving. She used the money inherited from her brother to pay the fine and spent the rest within two months spoiling herself and buying luxuries including a new car, which she wrecked shortly afterwards driving drunk, and with all the money gone, she went back to hustling and prostitution. From 1976 to 1986, Eileen was busy having a good time and doing what it took to survive. She was arrested for assault, disturbing the peace for throwing a cue ball at a bartender's head, drunk driving, committed armed robbery with a 22 caliber pistol in 1981, for which she did three years in jail, forged checks, suspected of stealing gun and ammunition, resisting arrest, and obstruction of justice for providing identification bearing her aunt's name, and vehicle theft. In 1986, Warnos met 24-year-old hotel maid Tyra Moore at Daytona Beach Gay Bar called the Zodiac, and it was love at first sight. They became inseparable, and by the late 80s, they were living in the Fairview Motel in Daytona Beach. Tyra worked at the Casa del Mar Beach Resort. Warner still continued to prostitute herself. Tyra was doing a lot of beer drinking and stuff. She wanted to go out all the time, so she was burning up the money I was making. Eileen was in her mid-30s, and after a lifetime of prostitution, she was losing her looks. It was getting harder and harder to earn money. Most of Eileen's customers were in the military, and when the Gulf War started, business was bad. In December 1989, Warnell started killing men in and around Central Florida. Our rent was due $1,200 behind. Richard Charles Mallory, a convicted rapist, was 51 years old. He was murdered on November 30, 1989. Two days later, a Velocia County deputy sheriff found Mallory's abandoned vehicle. On December 13th, his body was found several miles away in a wooded area covered with a piece of carpet. The heat and insects had taken their toll. They had been shot several times. Two bullets to the left lung were found to be the cause of death. Serial killer. David Andrew Spears, age 47, a construction worker, was declared missing on May 19, 1990. On June 1, 1990, his naked body was found along U.S. Route 19 in Florida in Citrus County. He had been shot six times by a 22 caliber pistol. Serial killer. Charles Edmund Carskaden, age 40, was killed May 31, 1990. On June 6, 1990, his body was found in Pasco County. He had been shot nine times with a 22 caliber weapon. The body had been wrapped in an electric blanket and was badly decomposed when found. Serial killer. Peter Symes, age 65, was a retired merchant seaman. In June 1990, Symes left Jupiter, Florida for Arkansas. On July 4, 1990, his car was found after an accident in Orange Springs, Florida. Two women were seen abandoning the car who refused help and fled the scene. Police traced the car to Peter Symes, who was reported missing three weeks earlier. Sketches were made from witnesses and released to one local paper, but nothing came of it, and the two women were never found. Serial killer. Troy Eugene Burris, age 50, was a sausage salesman from Ocala. On July 30, 1990, he was reported missing. On August 4, 1990, his body was found in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. He had been shot twice. Serial killer. Charles Richard Dick Humphreys, age 56, was murdered on September 11, 1990. He was a retired Air Force major, former state child abuse investigator, and a former chief of police. On September 12, 1990, his body was found in Marion County. He was fully clothed and had been shot six times in the head and torso. His car was found in Suwanee County. Serial killer. Walter Geno Antonio, age 62, was a trucker, security guard, and police reservist. On November 19, 1990, Antonio's nearly naked body was found near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He had been shot four times. Five days later, his car was found in Brevard County. Serial killer. Authorities realized they had a serial killer on their hands. These men were murdered in five different counties, and all had been shot with a 22 caliber handgun. They began to focus on Peter Symes' car, that had been crashed and abandoned in July by two women. Witnesses who had seen the women driving the cars provided police with descriptions. The sketches were previously released only to one local paper, now they were released statewide. Immediately they received calls that they were seen in the Daytona and Port Orange area. Two names kept coming up, Eileen Lee Warnos and Tyra Moore. Please check their backgrounds, Tyra had no record. Eileen had a lengthy one with many aliases. The release of the sketches caused panic and tension between the two lovers. Tyra fled to Scranton, Pennsylvania. This was devastating to Eileen. Eileen was all alone again and homeless. In late December, police discovered pawn shop records of items that had been stolen from the victims. It was the break detectives were looking for. Legally, you have to leave a fingerprint when pawning items in Florida. The police matched Warno's fingerprints in the pawn shop ticket and in the victim's cars. 
A mammoth manhunt was initiated, and Warnos was tracked on the Port Orange, Florida. The police followed one of their leads to the Fairview Motel. The hotel room had been registered under one of Eileen's aliases. They were told she also hung out at the Last Resort, a local biker bar. Detectives followed her for two days. They held off arresting her, waiting to see whether she made contact with Moore, the other suspect. Fearing she might ride off on the back of a bike, they made their move. Stop over there, man. Are you under arrest? For what? For what? On the 9th of January 1991, Warnos was arrested at the last resort bar. She was advised that she was wanted on an outstanding warrant. The press were not informed of the arrest, and no mention was made of the murder charges at stage to the press or Warnos. The following day, Tyra Moore was traced to her sister's home in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Tyra Moore made a deal to help the police build a case against Warnos, and the two conducted a series of recorded telephone conversations over the next few days, during which Moore pleaded with Warnos to confess, to spare her from prosecution as an accomplice. Warnos was initially cautious on the phone, but faced with the prospect that Moore, who was the love of her life, would be prosecuted, said she would confess if she had to. I love you. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should. No time, time. What if they don't believe me? Warnos confessed to six of the murders on the 6th of January 1991, claiming that they were all acts of self-defense and that Moore had no involvement at all in any of them. A year later, on January 14, 1992, Warnos went to trial for the murder of Mallory. Although previous convictions are normally inadmissible in criminal trials, under Florida's William Rule, the prosecution was allowed to introduce evidence related to her other crimes to show a pattern of illegal activity. On January 27, 1992, Warnus was convicted of Mallory's murder with the help from Moore's testimony. At her sentencing, psychiatrists for the defense testified that Warnus was mentally unstable and had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. The defense was trying to spare her the death penalty, but four days later, on January 31, 1992, Aline Warnos was sentenced to death. On March 31, 1992, Warnos pleaded no contest to the murders of Humphreys, Burris, and Spears, saying she wanted to get right with God. In her statement to the court, she said in part, I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me, as I've told you, but others did not. They only began to. On May 15, 1992, Warnos was given three more death sentences. In June of 1992, Warnos pleaded guilty to the murder of Kars Gaiden. In November 1992, she received her fifth death sentence. In February 1993, Warnos pleaded guilty to the murder of Antonia and was sentenced to death again. No charges were brought against her in the murder of Symes, as his body was never found. In all, she received six death sentences. How many times you gotta kill me, you know what I mean? Warnos was incarcerated in the Florida Department of Corrections Broward Correctional Institution, death row for women. Her first appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was denied in 1996. In a 2001 petition to the Florida Supreme Court, she stated her intention to dismiss her legal counsel and terminate all pending appeals. I killed those men, she wrote, robbed them as cold as ice, and I do it again too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I killed again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of hearing this, she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm telling the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life, and I would kill again. While her attorneys argued that she was not mentally competent to make such a request, Warnos insisted that she knew what she was doing, and a court-appointed panel of psychiatrists agreed. Aline Warnos' execution took place on October 9, 2002. She was awoken at 5.30 a.m. She requested a towel and washcloth to wash her face and freshen up. She was very calm all morning, and not as talkative as she usually was. She declined her last meal, which could have been anything under $20, and opted for a cup of coffee instead. What the f when it was time, Warnos was wheeled down the hall into the death chamber. She was then strapped to a gurney and hooked to two intravenous lines. A brown curtain was drawn back, and Warnos turned to 32 witnesses, made a bizarre face, kind of smiled, rolled her eyes, and turned away. Her last words were, Yes, I would like to say, I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back, like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6th like the movie, Big Mothership and all. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. The process of injecting lethal drugs in both of her arms started promptly at 9.30 a.m. At 9.31, she shut her eyes and her head jerked back. At 9.32, her mouth dropped open and her eyes opened to slits, and it appeared she was gone. Eileen Warnos was officially pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m. It took six minutes to execute her. Eileen Warnos never had a chance in life. Abandoned by her mother, sexually abused, beaten, and never nurtured, 
bullied, prostituting herself at 11, left all alone and homeless at 15. Her life on the road as a hitchhiking prostitute slowly killed any hope that she had of turning her life around and having a normal life. Years of abuse and rapes from Johns turned into anger and fueled her blackout temper. Eileen was like a wild animal who would do anything to survive. She was taken advantage of and lied to her whole life. The life in her eyes slowly disappeared when she blacked out and she had the thousand yard stare of a soldier of war. As for the so-called love of her life, Tyra Moore, she knew a lot more than she let on. Eileen told her about the murder of Mallory the night she committed it. Yet Tyra still stayed with Warnos, up until the sketches were released, and to save herself she betrayed Warnos and left her all alone in the end. Eileen Warnos was cremated and her ashes were spread beneath a tree in her native Michigan by one of her only true childhood friends, Don Botkins. Single most happy time in your life, what, what do you think you've enjoyed most? I've been through so much hell, I can't even think of something there. She was sleeping in the snow and living in the woods. Because mm -hmm. I was sleeping in the snow. Out in the woods, sleeping on the ground, in the snow. I know nothing about that. So tell that damn whore I can give a f she even had me. That Tyra is very innocent. I don't want an innocent person hurt. I was afraid of her after a while. We're going to be, you know, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. I'm all right. I'm all right with it. Still miss her and I still love her. And I feel like the other girl could have stopped some of them if she'd have come forward. She knew about some of them, but she didn't say anything. It was a hard walk in, but it was even a harder walk out. And I told the guard, I said, can you open that door a little quicker? I don't want to look back at her. All you could hear is saying, I love you, Dawn. I'll see you on the other side. And I said, I love you, too. I thought, don't look back. To be cremated and come home to my house, be around the people that love her. I put her ashes right around her tree when we got home. She wanted me to do that. And this is where she's at. To me, this world is nothing but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another. And that, this last time I'm going to say it, you have to kill Eileen Warren because she'll kill again. Oh, yeah, Ty always knew everything I was doing. Serial killer. See you later. Welcome to my channel. This is Mr. Scary. Hope you enjoy the show.